Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Okay, time for bed, is what I said to the empty living room. It was getting late, and the internet no longer amused me. I picked up my cell phone, rooted through the couch cushions until I located the remote, and turned off the television screen that had been nothing but background noise for the last few hours. I made sure the front and back doors were securely locked, walked around the back of the couch, and turned off the only light. A tap on the screen of my phone created just enough light to keep from busting a toe on an errant table leg. Because my cats have an evil tendency to lie in the middle of the hallway, I aimed the small amount of light from my phone directly in front of my tired and shuffling feet. I'd only covered a small distance before I knew from many nights of this same regimen that I was getting close to the bedroom door. At this point, my arm started the slow, upward arc that would eventually illuminate the now pitch-black opening to the comfort of my room. The light emanating from my cell was quite dim, and this action had become quite rote, so my arc was about waist level before I noticed a slight variation of the familiar black of the open doorway. At that point, and in a disturbingly short amount of time, five things happened nearly simultaneously. My arm, the arm carrying the phone, continued to rise in its predetermined arc, having been an object in motion which would stay in motion. I release a small gasp and exclaimed to my husband that his sudden appearance in the dark had startled the breath out of me. I remembered that my husband was at work. The light arc reached its apex on a face of protruding, nail-like teeth, a face suspiciously bereft of eyes, with a gaping, oozing, bloody pit where a nose should have been. The light went out. Driving home from my boss's dinner party at midnight, I had an experience that I'd like to share with you. I hadn't drunk too much that night and I was taking the drive home slow. However, at some point on my way home, I dozed off, actually fell asleep at the wheel. Suddenly my head was raised from the lowered position it was in and my eyes were forced open. I saw a metal guardrail coming right at me. I was suddenly driving at 85 miles per hour. As fast as my eyes were opened, something grabbed my wrists and moved the steering wheel. The car glanced past the guardrail, I could hear the screeching tires, and I thought for a second that the car was going to tip over. It didn't. My guardian angel saved my life that night. I'm sure of it. I have never attended a party since.
I usually wake up in the middle of the night. It seems to be a habit that I have developed. Anyway, this one night, I woke up and I saw something standing at the bottom of my bed. A bright white light shone around the figure, and I couldn't make anything else out. It was such a soothing experience, not scary at all. That's my only paranormal experience. I had an experience in Gloucester Place, London, a few years ago. In the night, I was taken very ill and I was visited by a beautiful, sophisticated young Victorian woman who had been an author during her life. Naturally, I was terrified, firstly by the appearance of a ghost and secondly by the fact she had come to help me over to the other side. She regarded me as a kindred spirit and persuaded me that death and the next life were nothing to be afraid of. If I wanted to let go, then all I had to do was to take her hand and she would guide me through to the next world. After what felt like a couple of hours in the company of this charming, sweet character, my fever lifted and slowly she began to vanish with the onset of morning. I'm extremely grateful to her for helping me in my struggle to survive, and I'm sure we will meet again, hopefully in many, many years' time. My grandma passed over back in 1967. It was a shock to all that knew her, for she was only 57 years old. She was a firebrand and left behind her loving husband, three daughters, and three sons. Naturally, the loss of your mother at such a young age was hard for all of her children. They all missed her spark and often spoke about her. A year or so had passed and the family was beginning to recover after the wake of such an unexpected death. Grandma's oldest daughter, S, who looked just like Grandma, had my brother and I to take care of, which kept her busy. Mom went out with her friends one night and had hired a local sitter to watch my brother and I. As the night went on, the kids went to bed and the sitter had asked her boyfriend to come over. The next thing I knew, there was a scream downstairs as someone walked in on the couple, who I presume were up to the usual teenage activities. The sitter started to apologize to the person she thought was our mother. An argument took place, which I thought was strange as my mother was not confrontational. I remember the intruder saying, get your clothes on and go home, you whore. The sitter left in disarray. She wasn't paid and I went back to sleep. I thought mom had come home early. The next morning I came downstairs with my brother to find my mother on the phone. She was talking to the sitter and asking, why did you leave my kids all alone last night? The sitter apparently said she had been sent home. I'm not sure if she repeated why she was sent home. My mother looked amazed and said, I certainly did not send you home. My mother later told me that the sitter had said that someone came in the house and told the sitter to leave, and it certainly looked like mom. I later told my mother that I had actually heard what was going on and asked what had upset her. She told me that she hadn't come home early that night. She had been out with her boyfriend at a club, dancing. So I presume Grandma came in and confronted the horny babysitter. Go figure. On the edge of town, there's a very old graveyard. It had a name at one point, but the marker has been worn down to such a degree that the name is now unreadable. Most of us just call it the Boneyard. The graves are some of the oldest in America. Some of the tombs are falling apart and many of the graves are unattended. Sometimes you see a bouquet, wreath, or some sort of remembrance, but not very often. One day I was walking home and happened to be walking past the graveyard. 
A man wearing a blue suit and tie and old bell-bottoms was wandering through the graveyard. He had blue eyes, shaggy hair and sideburns. He looked like a caricature of the 70s. I watched him more surprised than someone was visiting the graveyard rather than by his appearance. He walked down a path towards a grave and disappeared right in front of my eyes. I have visited the graveyard since then to try and see him. I haven't seen him, but his grave is one of the newer ones. It does fit the time period. Did I see a man who died in the 1970s? I think so. I was Topeka, Kansas born, but grew up in the Chicago suburbs. I went through the Carpenters Union Apprentice program after high school. Returning to the Chicago area after being a carpenter for a few years, I met what now would be called a cougar. This beautiful woman was from Ireland, and though never a love relation, she owned a lot of property and had me renovate six or eight places. She owned a bar and had apparently divorced eight wealthy men. I only knew this as the patrons in her bar knew of at least four, although when cleaning out a shed behind her house as requested, I threw out wedding pictures from eight obviously wealthy guys she had married. Anyway, she had me redo and make apartments out of a farmhouse in Downers Grove. It was by then surrounded by suburbs but was the original farmhouse in that area before all the development. Joni would come by once a week to pay me but would only park in the driveway and refused to come in to view the work progress. I would complain, but she wrote the checks and so it went. One day, she came by to pay me and I was like, come in and look. But she said, I can't, and she couldn't tell me why. Finally, after asking her many times, she broke down and told me the place was haunted and she didn't want anyone to think she was crazy. I told her of my own recent ghost experiences in Minneapolis, and then she opened up. After her first divorce, I'm guessing about when I was born, she got this house from her lawyer husband and brought her mother over from Ireland. She told me her mother would see a young girl follow her around the house, up and down the stairs. Well, anyway, after a while, she told me she would be violently woken up in the middle of the night with a girl's face and smoke inches from her face. This scared the crap out of her and she had a paranormal investigation done. They found out that the farm had burned down in the early 1800s and the farmer's young daughter had perished in the fire. They went on to say that in spite of the Catholic priests her mother and she had brought in to try to get rid of the spirit, that this girl's ghost continued trying to take over her body. Joni never went back in that place, and I know she told me the truth. This was many years ago, and if she were still alive, she would be at least 80. I was peacefully sleeping when I was awakened by what I felt like two hands gripping my ankles and pressing them down onto the bed, making me unable to move my feet. Thinking I was about to be raped by intruders, I screamed and was yelling as I tried kicking my feet but could barely move. In a panic, I started swinging my fists through the air and struck nothing as my eyes adjusted to the morning light in the room. I paused, catching my breath. Still and silent, I glanced quickly around the room. There was no one there. I could still feel the tight grip on my ankles, and I tried to move my feet, but couldn't. I took a deep breath and screamed my son's name as I threw my pillow at the nothing that had a grip on me. My son burst into my room. What, Mom? What's the matter? I said, something's had a hold of my ankles and held me down. He said, I've been up for an hour. There's nobody here, Mom. You were dreaming. I said, didn't you hear me yelling and screaming? Our apartment is small, 
you could hear a whisper from one end to the other, but he replied, I heard you call my name just now. There's nobody here, Mom. It's all right. You were dreaming. There was no convincing him. I know logic is working against me, but I wasn't dreaming. I was wide awake, fighting and yelling. I felt the hands. I couldn't move. I was awake, and there was no one there. My ankles hurt. The next day, I had bruises. It was explained away that maybe I bruised myself from kicking my feet. But that's not what happened at all. I look back as it is now, and the thoughts still plaguing me are too much for one soul to bear. Madness, fear, paranoia, despair, and more spine-chilling terror than even I can scarcely describe. My name will not be known, but for the sake of argument, you may call me Mournful Magnus, a regular boy from a regular town hidden away from the eyes of most. My childhood was normal enough, I suppose. I would excel at school, have a decent amount of good friends, and enjoy the privacy of my home and my garden, most of all my prized garden pond. I lived in a forest then, a deep forest so dense you could scream and the sound would be muffled to an extent that there would be no echo. If you scream, it became a whisper, a very low whisper that not many will hear. In my free time, as a young lad, I would take to hiking the forest trails in search of quiet and mystery, and would often try to study the mountains I called home. I always walked with my staff, a stick of bamboo that I found one day as I hiked next to a cave that I took to calling the Cave of Echoes, because the wind would make the cave sound like moaning children and echo the unsettling sound for hours on end without pause. I would never go inside this cave, only near it, because of the unsettling sound it made. That is, until one fateful day, the one day that I have regretted for my entire life since that accursed turn of events that threatens to steal my very soul. I told my best friend about the cave, and he wanted to see it, so I told him to stay at my house and we would go the next day. We slept peacefully that night, and by what I remember, it would be the last good night's sleep I would have for eight years since then. The next day, we got up and had a big breakfast, and we got ready for the simple hike to the cave. My friend packed his backpack, and I just took my staff, knowing it was all I needed. The trek was utterly slow. My friend would bug me constantly with, are we there yet, or how far is it? and make it seem longer than it actually was. But finally, we got to the cave, and he would simply hear the moaning opening in the earth and shiver. I showed him it, and he was trying to see where the cave was getting its sound, and he asked, what is the cause of the noise? And I simply said, the wind makes the cave echo. And he did not believe me. I kept trying to tell him that the wind is the cause to blame, since it sounded off every time the wind blew. He eventually relented and said that we should leave because this place gives me the creeps. As we were about to turn around, he heard it again but was baffled as to why. He held his finger up and noted that there was no wind at that time, yet the sounds were louder than ever and at that moment, a shiver went up my spine. I said that we should get out of there as soon as possible but he said he wanted to go in to see. He called me a scaredy cat for wanting to leave now. I don't like being called a coward, so I relented and walked into the cave but with extreme caution. He followed behind. It was damp and very dark and smelled of mold and decay. I hated it, but continued anyway. We looked up and down, looked all around, looking for the source of the infernal sound, but to no avail. We had to go deeper and deeper into that wretched cave. The smell became worse and started to become sickening. 
He stuck close to me, very close. His nerves were on a hair trigger. He'd jump at pebbles falling, and he asked, how can you be so calm? This place is creepy. I simply showed him my staff. This staff I have had for a while. I found it just outside the cave. It makes me feel strangely safe in this place. He asked if he could hold the staff, and I gave it to him, but then we stopped. We heard the moaning again, this time louder than ever before, almost a scream, a shriek from some specter or spook that I had not yet been able to fathom. But when we reached the depth of the cave, we found a grim scene. Bones littered the ground, and all of them looked like the remains of little kids, and only we found a carving on a stone that read, as I recall, Beware! Beware the Black Whisperer! He lurks in this cave. If you think his name aloud, we rise from out of our grave, and we shall haunt you and taunt you. We shall skulk behind you, unable to see us. We're behind you right now, for with this verse you did free us. We were freaking out, not just because of the bones or creepy poem, but because we heard a shift, and then we heard a giggle from behind us. We were freaking out by this point and turned around only to see a shadow, a little girl standing there with long ebony hair and soulless, piercing eyes that glowed sickly yellow. She came closer and said, run all you want, I'm always going to be there now. We ran as fast as we could out of that cave. We got hit with cuts and bruises. We fell and slipped in desperation to get away. When we finally got hopes of escaping, when we could see the light, but our hopes were easily crushed. A fog had come upon the woods, which rarely happens, but it was so thick we couldn't even see the hand in front of our faces. So we ran as fast as we could. We were lost, but we didn't care. We wanted to escape. We wanted to go home. I regretted ever coming here, but we could still hear her wicked laughter right behind us. And then the most horrible experience of my life occurred. My best friend, she grabbed him and took him away to somewhere no one knows. I kept running. I kept running home and finally the fog cleared and I easily knew where I was. There were police everywhere, search parties and squads searching for someone. When I got home, I saw my best friend's mom and my mother crying on the couch when they looked up to see me walk in with a look of absolute terror on my face. I told them everything. They didn't believe me and kept demanding to know where my friend was since I was the last one with him. But I told them that we went to a cave and they had never heard of a cave in the area and so I took the police to it. I was scared to go back there to have to see that little girl ever again. The thought of her ran through my mind and I started to cry immensely, which caught the officers by surprise and found that I was becoming hysterical. But how could I not be hysterical? I saw a cave littered with the bones of children, an evil girl with those sickly, piercing eyes, and I lost my best friend. I told them to follow the trail up ahead and stayed behind. They returned and asked if I had been joking and I asked why I would be joking, and they led me up the trail. I came up to the cave's entrance location only to find not even a hill where it once was, but right by the rock I found it, right where it was the first time, my staff. And not only that, but they found multiple footprints leading in a trail out of the forest and into a window of a house. Only then did I realize the horror of my predicament. They led to my room's window, where the footprints simply ended there and went nowhere else. I never saw my best friend again, but my ordeal was over, or at least so I thought. That very night I was trying to fall asleep when I heard that giggle again. That giggling demon was so close I could hear her. But then she started to sing Ring Around the Rosie as she shook hellish chains like a demon in the night. She would continue this, and every time I looked outside, she would come closer to the window, and if I looked enough times, she would disappear altogether and appear behind me, then she would take a step closer every time I kept my eyes off her. Every night she would appear, 
every night from then on after, whether I was in my home or in another's, in a hotel or on a ship. Even if I took refuge in a church, she would still come for me. She is not halted or daunted by anything. When you're alone or with friends, she will appear, and if you see your reflection in the dark, you will always see her eyes glowing over your shoulder, and she's always there, giggling and watching from behind. But there is a catch to my torment. If you remember the beginning, I said too much for one soul to bear, and so my release is done by a single method. Those of you who listened past the poem I found in that damned cave are now doomed to repeat my sentence, and you'll find that on the next time the sun falls over that horizon, she will be outside your house. If it's already dark, you are doomed. Only one way to escape her, to force another sorry soul into her grasp. On lonely nights, when no one is there, you may hear the whispers of children and will hear them knocking on your walls and doors in the middle of the night. She comes closer with a knife in the dark, whispering the names of her victims and your final requiem. She is clad in ebony, her eyes a sickly yellow. Beware the black whisperer, and you know what of all frightens most. Look behind you. What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different, or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers, but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes, along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and murderous minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Documentation of adverse events caused by shadow people is fairly modest. In fact, in most cases, they appear or disappear gradually as soon as detected. Shadow ones do not seem to speak any words, nor stand close to the witness while standing at the entrances and corners of rooms. Some people who have seen them or were aware of their existence say that they are strangers or beings slipping in and out of our physical plane. Are they an elusive race that has always coexisted with us humans? It's an interesting theory because it suggests that these beings do not only exist but are also frequent guests in our lives. However, in eyewitness accounts particularly one observation is mentioned, very often namely the observation of conformity of shadow apparitions. 
According to paranormal researcher Heidi Hollis, shadow people are malevolent supernatural entities. While it is remotely possible that shadow people could physically hurt you, perhaps through the moving of objects, they are more likely to attack you emotionally, as fear is what gives them energy. No matter if the witness is a child or adult, he or she always sees the same thing. All eyewitness accounts, no matter which country, continent, or language, give a glimpse at what was seen and experienced in the presence of shadow people. But this glimpse is a monotonous one. The only experience related to shadow ones which is not monotonous is fear. They bring a chilly feeling or vision of fear that overcomes, in the same way the black-eyed people do. Their recollections are strikingly similar to each other, although shadow ones are regularly part of life for many people. Those who have experienced and studied the phenomenon say that these elusive entities used to be seen only very briefly and out of the corner of the eye. They're just standing and stirring, always in silence. In recent times, a number of people who witnessed the presence of shadow beings for longer periods of time has increased. Some testify that they have even seen creepy red eyes of these dark, indistinguishable but often massive silhouettes that instantly appear anywhere and show the ability to walk through walls of confined spaces which defy common laws of physics. Many paranormal researchers have studied the phenomenon and in particular agree on one aspect of it. Whatever or whoever these entities are, they feed off human energy, emanate bad vibrations and negative emotions. Did they find a way to enter into our dimension or accidentally slipped into our physical plane? Are they alien entities, time travelers, interdimensional beings on a mission to observe and influence humans, or are they looking for human closeness? We do not know. We simply have them as bad life companions, associated with bad luck. Randy Wright knows all too well the fear that comes with sleep. When other people snuggle under the covers and prepare to drift off to a world of sweet dreams, he braces himself for what will more than likely be a night of frightening events ranging from disembodied voices talking gibberish to dark, shadowy figures gliding around his room or huddling beside his bed. Growing up in Raleigh, North Carolina, Randy had an idyllic childhood. He and his brothers spent days fishing in a nearby lake and nights running around the yard at their grandma's house chasing fireflies. It was as normal an upbringing as a child could have. That is, until Randy was around 15 years old and the shadow people began visiting him. Things have never been the same and the idyllic life he once had is now just a distant memory. Randy was one of six boys born into a military family. His father was based in Maryland, but his mother and siblings spent most of their time staying with their maternal grandmother in Raleigh. Randy, being the oldest brother, slept in a makeshift bedroom in his grandma's attic. Randy was an avid comic book collector and spent most nights falling asleep while reading one of his many comics. The night that would ultimately change his life forever began like any other. He had drifted off to sleep in the usual way when he was awakened by the sound of voices in his attic bedroom. Although the room was dark, the light shining in through the small attic window revealed to Randy that there were people moving about in his room. They were very tall and had to hunch over to keep from hitting their heads on the ceiling. There were at least three or four people in the room with Randy. They had no discernible features all Randy could determine about his uninvited guests was that they were tall and very dark, more like shadows of people than actual people, and they were talking in a language that he didn't understand, but they were clearly communicating with each other. Randy wanted to get up off his bed and run downstairs, but his legs were like lead. He discovered that his arms were useless as well. 
he was helpless as the shadow people gathered around his bed and began to prod at him. He could see that they were lifting his arms up and examining them. Randy knew that he was crying, although he couldn't make a sound. One of the shadows leaned down and put its face very close to Randy's cheek, as if it was fascinated by his tears. He closed his eyes tightly and repeated over and over in his head, this isn't happening, it's not real. When he opened his eyes, the shadow people were gone. Randy would use this method many times in the coming years to rid himself of the strange intruders. The following morning, when Randy joined the rest of the family for breakfast, for whatever reason, he decided not to mention the people he had seen in his room the night before. The more he thought about it, the more he was convinced that it was all a dream. The telling would come later. Little did Randy know at the time, but that was just the beginning of his encounters with the Shadow People. An almost exact replay of that first visit would be repeated on the next night. The only difference was that on the second visit, one of them spoke a word that Randy recognized. As the Shadow People were gathered around his bed, one of them had pointed to Randy and said the word, boy. The visits continued unabated for weeks, and they were nearly identical in nature each time. Randy would fall asleep and wake in the middle of the night to find the intruders surrounding his bed, poking and prodding him. Sometimes they would tickle him and be mesmerized by his response. At other times, they would pinch him or pull his hair. Any reaction Randy had seemed to cause a stir of activity and chatter among the night visitors. When it all got to be too much for him, Randy would make himself wake up and they would be gone. Thinking that since telling himself during the encounters that the shadow people weren't real almost always ended the visits immediately, Randy tried to avoid the situation entirely by telling himself over and over before falling asleep that the shadow people weren't real and it was all just a dream. It didn't work. They would still come every night like clockwork. He could only end the nightmares once they were happening. He couldn't prevent them. The visits from the shadow people went on for years without Randy saying a word to anyone about them. That is, until one night when he was 19 years old and preparing to move out of his grandmother's house. Randy had packed up almost all of his belongings and was preparing to leave for several weeks of Army basic training. He was going to be a military man like his father and couldn't wait to embark on his new life. He was worn out from a long day of packing and had no trouble falling asleep on this particular night. It wasn't long before the shadow people appeared in the room and began their usual routine of poking and prodding at Randy. On this night, however, they were especially curious and a bit rougher than they had ever been before. Randy remembers them taking something shiny out of a bag that one of them was holding and running it up and down one of his legs. Whatever the object was, it stung and Randy wanted to cry out, but he couldn't make a sound. He wasn't usually afraid of the visitors who had been haunting him for years, but on this night, something was different. He closed his eyes and told himself that this was just a dream. It wasn't happening. Wake up. Randy opened his eyes and the shadows were gone. He could move now, so he got up and turned on the light. He could see that there was a long red mark running the length of his right leg from the hip all the way down to his ankle. It couldn't be, but it was. Whatever instrument they had used that had stung his leg in his sleep had left a mark that was clearly visible. Truly fearful of what the shadow people might do next, Randy finally confided in his mother. He told her of the almost nightly visitations that had plagued him for years. He showed her the long red mark that ran down his right leg as well. He had been sure that the tall, dark intruders had existed only in his dream state, but now he had his doubts. Randy's mother tried to find a logical explanation for the red mark on her son's leg. Perhaps he had scratched himself while in the throes of a nightmare or maybe there was a nail or some other sharp object that he had rubbed up against on his way to the bathroom and was too sleepy to notice at the time. They both knew that those were possibilities, but unlikely. Randy had seen what happened, or at least he thought he had. 
This opened up a discussion with his mother about the possibility that Randy had been the unwitting victim in an alien experiment of some kind. As far-fetched as it sounds, these events took place in the mid-1970s when reports of alleged alien abductions were running rampant in the tabloid media. Television movies were made that depicted supposedly true-life accounts of people who had been spirited away, usually while they slept, to some sort of spaceship where they were poked and prodded and otherwise examined. It all sounded very similar to what Randy had been experiencing for years. There were a few differences, though. Randy didn't think that the intruders in his room looked like aliens, or at least the way he had seen aliens depicted in drawings and movies. His visitors were dark and shadowy. They didn't have large eyes or bulbous heads. They didn't have any eyes at all that Randy could ever see. He also wondered if they were in fact aliens, why did telling himself that they weren't real make them go away? He and his mother mulled over everything they knew about alien abduction stories, which wasn't much, and decided that this was probably something else. Randy had never left his room, he was sure of that. There had been no spaceship or any other vessel that he had ever seen when the visitors were present. They appeared without warning, and then they were gone when he more or less wished them away. Today, a worried mother might rush her son to the doctor to have the mysterious red mark checked out, but this was a different time and Randy and his mother didn't pursue medical attention. The long, angry scratch healed on its own and left no scar. The skin hadn't been broken, so the mark eventually faded away. Randy moved out of his grandmother's house and straight to an army post for his basic training. He would be on site for several weeks during boot camp. Randy soon discovered that the nightmares or visitations which had plagued him for years suddenly stopped. He had normal dreams and woke up unscathed, something he wasn't accustomed to. During his short breaks between basic training and deployment, Randy went back to his grandma's house in Rala to await his assignment. While there, the nightly visits from the Shadow People picked up where they had left off weeks earlier. It was on his first night back home in the attic that he woke up to find that he couldn't move anything except his eyes. His body felt like a dead weight that he could not control. All around him there were dark figures examining him from head to toe. They were literally pulling his fingers and toes apart and looking between them. Whereas there had usually been no more than three or four shadow visitors, Randy could see that now there were at least twice as many. They all looked identical, tall, no discernible features, all with normal-sized human hands. They spoke to each other in something that sounded like a language, not just gibberish. Although Randy couldn't understand them, they could understand each other, just as he remembered. What made the whole incident so surreal for Randy was that they seemed particularly interested in his right leg, the one that had been scratched during a previous visit. The visitors took turns looking at the leg and then sharing information with one another. Fearing what might come next, Randy decided to wake himself up. He closed his eyes and began telling himself that the visitors weren't real. As had been the case in all of his dealings with the Shadow People, they were gone when he opened his eyes. This scenario repeated itself for the nearly two weeks he spent at his grandmother's house before moving on with his army unit. Once he was away from the attic bedroom, the nightly visits stopped. He didn't have one incident during his stint in the military, no matter where he was sleeping. After his discharge from the army, Randy moved into a rental home with some buddies he had been stationed with. Almost immediately upon settling into the new house, the visitors returned. It was as if the years they had been absent from his sleep had never happened. Randy finally realized that whatever these visitations were, Figments of his imagination, nightmares, hallucinations, alien encounters, or some other unexplainable occurrence, it was time to get some help. His first stop was to a local doctor who could find nothing physically wrong with Randy. Chalking the night disturbances up to stress, he prescribed some anti-anxiety medication and told Randy that he should see improvements within six weeks. Six weeks came and went, with little change in Randy's nighttime routine. He had trouble remembering the encounters, his mind seemed foggier, but he felt sure that they were still happening. 
he returned to the doctor who had prescribed the medication for a follow-up visit. Since the doctor could find no medical reason for what he determined to be stress-induced hallucinations, he referred Randy to a mental health specialist, figuring that Randy's condition was perhaps more psychological than physiological in nature. The psychiatrist Randy saw suggested he begin a regular course of counseling sessions to try and get to the bottom of whatever it was that was tormenting him so much in his subconscious that it was manifesting as shadow people in his sleep. The psychiatrist was sure that once Randy worked through his mental health issues, the visitors would no longer trouble him. The therapy sessions did help Randy to de-stress. Talking about his problems and fears did help to relieve his troubled mind. It did not, however, stop the visitations. The shadowy figures still appeared to Randy nearly every night. Sometimes they stood around him, staring and talking to one another. On other nights, they would prod at him with their hands as well as with instruments Randy could not identify. After explaining to his psychiatrist that therapy hadn't halted the nighttime visitations from these shadow people, the doctor prescribed a fairly potent cocktail of antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. The therapy sessions also continued. The medications he had to take made Randy feel numb to everything. They also gave him terrible stomach pains, but they did all but stop the nocturnal encounters he'd been subjected to for years. Eventually, after several different changes in medication, the visits stopped altogether. After finding the right dosages, Randy was also better able to tolerate the medicine that kept the visitors at bay. He has not had a visit from the shadow people in nearly 20 years. Was what Randy experienced a form of sleep paralysis? It certainly had some of the telltale signs. Dark figures, body immobility, the ability to end the encounters by convincing himself it wasn't real. Also, the glaring fact that medication seemed to put a stop to the encounters seems to make a case for sleep paralysis. A few things are troubling with that theory. For one, how did Randy get the mysterious scratch that ran the length of his right leg? Why did he not have any visitations while serving in the military? Why was he spared the almost universal experience suffered by victims of sleep paralysis, the feeling of something heavy on the sleeping person's chest? Randy believes that whatever was happening to him during those visitations, it was sleep-related and did not involve creatures from another realm. His mother, who passed away before Randy was finally free from his nightmares, came to believe that her son was being examined by beings from another planet. One thing I neglected to mention about Randy is that he is a genius. He tested through the roof on any and all intelligent tests he has ever taken. He has a photographic memory which allows him to recall even the most mundane occurrences. If aliens were going to choose someone to examine as an example of the human race, they couldn't have found a more suitable candidate than Randy Wright. When confronted with this observation, Randy shrugs nonchalantly. I think I was having bad dreams. There are people a lot smarter than I am in the world. Yet he is quick to add, the only thing that bothers me is the scratch. I never did figure that one out. Even geniuses can have their doubts. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark.
I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.